As the Straw Hats arrive at Arabasta, Nami expects everyone to be on their best behavior. However, Luffy immediately runs off to get food, separating from his crew. The crew then notices that Mr. Three's ship is docked nearby and Vivi remembers that the ship moves by the means of Mr. Three's Doru Doru no Mai. Vivi says that she and Karu cannot go onto the streets since most of the citizens would immediately recognize her, so Usopp comes up with an idea to walk through the streets while hiding under a blanket. After walking through the streets being concealed under a blanket, they manage to get to a safe place. Vivi says that she plans on going to Yuba where the rebels' base is, but the only way for them to travel is crossing the desert so they decided to stock up on supplies. Sanji and Chopper are the only ones who missed her. Three has not seen so they go off to buy the supplies. In the middle of a desert, Luffy finds himself lost but then sees smoke in the distance and thinks that the smoke is coming from a restaurant. Sanji and Chopper are buying the supplies they need but Chopper notices a strange smell which makes him feel uncomfortable and Sanji tells him that it is called perfume. Sanji is distracted by the beautiful women in Arabasta and Chopper cannot bear the aroma, so Sanji tells him that he would take care of the shopping and runs off, yelling for the women. Chopper is exhausted by the heat, so he decides to rest in a truck with enough shade to cool down. He decides to take a nap inside until Sanji returns, but after he falls asleep, the truck starts to travel with Chopper inside. Luffy stands in front of the building that had smoke coming out, but much to his disappointment, he thinks it does not look anything like a restaurant. Luffy sees a pile of bags filled with green powder and comments that it tastes awful after trying a little. He then puts all the bags into the incinerator thinking it must be poison. When the bags are being burnt, Luffy notices the smoke coming out of the chimney turning into a faded green color and then dark clouds start to appear. Rain starts falling from the clouds and a man inside the building realizes the rain and rushes outside. The man starts getting upset since the powder was his great ambition, apologizes and says that he could simply buy it again but the man says that it is very difficult to get and accidentally reveals that the sale is prohibited, making Luffy realize that the old man is a criminal. When Chopper wakes up he is confused and panics because the truck is moving. After that, the truck stops as it arrives to where Koza is. Inside a room, a man coming to Koza has a short talk and Koza says that he and the rebel army will change Arabasta. While Chopper is nervous, Matsuj helps Chopper escape. Chopper asks the camel why he helped him escape, and it replies by saying that it makes him look cool. Chopper thinks that the camel is weird but fun. Chopper then goes back to Nanohana by following the aroma of perfume. Luffy is sitting along with Kamonegi, whose face is swollen. Luffy asks the man what the powder was for, and he replies that the green powder is called dance powder, also known as rain calling powder. It goes through a complicated process to artificially make rainfall. He then goes on saying that Arabasta has fought against drought since ancient times, but they were not able to use dance powder since it is prohibited by the world government, and that the rebellion is one of the outcomes of the drought. Sanji and Chopper come back from shopping and they now plan on going to Yuba. Vivi says that this will be a scorching, hot journey and they put all their strengths into the journey. However, they suddenly remember that Luffy is missing. In Nanohana, a young man previously shown in Drum Kingdom is shown walking the town. A salesman approaches him claiming to have a magical golden apple, but he refuses to buy it. Chopper and Usopp overhear the offer, but Nami and Zoro stop them from being conned after Zoro finds an associate painting them. Zoro notices a man asking if people in the town had seen Luffy using his wanted poster. He is directed to Spice Bean where the owner knows many of the townspeople. The present Straw Hats wonder why he is looking for Luffy. Zoro notices the tattoo on the man's back and knows he is not a bounty hunter. He then sees Tashigi elsewhere in the town, dressing a shopkeeper down for overpricing swords and hides. Smoker appears, carrying several captured small-time pirates. He is sure Luffy will show up in Arabasta and as Tashigi take the defeated pirates to the royal army. Zoro wonders where Luffy ran off to. He is wandering across the desert and starts running when he sees a town nearby, hunger driving him to find food. At the Spice Bean restaurant, patrons are gathered around the young man seen earlier who is face first in a plate of food. They believe he has dropped dead mid-eating and suspect he was bitten by a venomous insect. Suddenly he wakes up, wipes his face off and resumes eating. He tells everyone he just fell asleep. Shortly after, he falls asleep again. After waking up, the man asks Yoshimoto if he has seen Luffy. They are interrupted by Smoker who noticed the earlier commotion. He identifies the young man as the second division commander of the Whitebeard Pirates, Portgas D. Ace, startling those present. When asked why he is here, Ace says he is looking for his brother. Luffy is running through Nanohana, tracing the scent of food. Smoker says he is not here for Ace, but will go ahead and try to capture him. Suddenly, Luffy uses Gomu Gomu no rocket to launch himself towards Spice Bean. He rams Smoker and Ace through the restaurant's rear wall and the walls of several adjacent buildings, then demands the restaurant owner make him food. While Luffy is chowing down, Ace and Smoker are on their way back to the restaurant. Ace apologizes to a family for disturbing their meal. 
Smoker identifies Luffy, though it takes a second for Luffy to remember him from their encounter at Logatown. He stacks all the remaining food in his mouth and runs, with Smoker chasing him. The owner notes that neither Ace nor Luffy paid for their meals. Luffy knows he cannot beat Smoker, so he goes looking for his crew. Smoker sees Tashigi and orders her to look for the straw hats as he pursues Luffy. As she runs, knowing that Luffy is in town, she thinks it is likely for Zoro to be there as well. Smoker asks Luffy why he is in Arabasta, to which he responds he came to beat up Crocodile. Smoker asks him how they are connected but Luffy disappears. On the other side of town, Nami, Zoro, Chopper, and Usopp catch back up with Sanji, Vivi, and Karu and tell them the Marine is present. They hear a commotion and Luffy soon runs to them, with Smoker on his trail. Smoker is intercepted by Ace, who uses Kijero to halt his attack, White Blow. Luffy recognizes Ace and is surprised he is a Devil Fruit user now. Ace tells him he ate the Mera Mera no Mai. He then tells Luffy to run and says he will hold Smoker off. Smoker asks why Ace is helping the Straw Hats and he says a big brother has to help his little brother. Luffy tells his crew that Ace is his brother, to their shock, as they make their getaway. Ace starts fighting Smoker while the crew is running away to the Going Merry. As they flee, Nami asks Luffy if Ace is really his brother. Luffy confirms this and tells them his name. A bifurcation is in their way and Nami tells everyone to follow her, but Luffy goes the other way, as he was watching his brother fight. The Straw Hats arrive at the ship and carry all the supplies, only to notice that Luffy is missing. Luffy is sitting on the barrel he was carrying in an alley, but he does not know where his crew went. Ace greets him from the top of a house in the alley and then comes down. They start arm wrestling on top of the barrel Luffy was sitting on, but after struggling, the barrel breaks and the water inside it scatters. They both agree that they are equally strong. Ace invites Luffy and his crew to join the Whitebeard Pirates, but Luffy declines. On Smoker's ship, Mr. Eleven is left alone, tied to the mast. Some billions get on the deck and Mr. Eleven asks them to untie him. They explain that as billions they are candidates to be promoted to officer agents, Mr. Eleven asks them to untie him again, but they shoot him. The billions get off the ship and someone informs them that Fire Fist Ace is in the town. One of them then comments that if they take down Ace, they will surely be promoted to officer agents. Luffy and Ace start searching for Luffy's crew, but as they walk, billions start to surround them without being noticed. After they are gathered, everyone comes out. Luffy and Ace do not care what they say and keep walking, but the billions start a fight. After Luffy sends the leader flying with Gomu Gomu Domu no Bazooka, one of the billions tells his comrades not to be scared by that, and everyone keeps chasing them again. Luffy spots his ship and stretches his arms in order to reach for it. He enters the ship ramming towards Sanji and Chopper. Ace reaches the ship in his boat, but then they spot five billion ships coming towards them. Ace tells Luffy that he can handle them, gets in his boat, and starts propelling it with the help of his flames. He then jumps over a ship, and when he lands, he launches a hyken, destroying the five ships consecutively. Smoker is talking to Tashigi and asks what Nefertari Vivi was doing with the straw hats. Tashigi proposes that perhaps she was a hostage to a major scheme, but Smoker does not think so. He thinks that is unlikely since she was getting along with the group as if she was one of them. He says that something big is going to occur, and that he may know where they are heading after Luffy told him he only wanted to beat Crocodile. Usopp, Luffy, and Chopper in the Going Merry are toasting for Ace joining the Straw Hats, but Ace tells them he is not joining them. After that, he explains that he is in search for Blackbeard after he killed one of his crewmates. He also explains that he is heading to Yuba, and Nami tells him that they are going to the same place. Vivi proceeds to explain the route, and after that, they toast for having a fun time together. Citizens are gathered outside the Alubarna Palace to see the king. The guards start to push them, when Nefertari Cobra comes out and tells them that everyone who wants to speak with him can come inside. He cannot solve their problems right now, but he can hear and empathize with them. He then tells the people that he will make the kingdom great again, even if it costs him his life. After that, he goes along with Pell and wonders where and what Vivi is doing. In The Going Merry, Luffy and Usopp are playing with the wet rice and Sanji hits them and tells them not to play with food. He then says that if they have nothing to do, they can wash the dishes. He says he has to pack lunches and Ace tells him that he can help, but Sanji declines because Ace is a guest. Asapi and Luffy start washing the dishes, but Sanji scolds them because they are using mop water to wash the dishes. Zoro is training while Chopper is feeling the breeze made by his swings. Vivi asks Nami if they can stop, as she has an important task for Karu. They are outside the ship on a shore and Vivi asks Karu if he can deliver a letter for his father, even though he has to cross a desert by himself. In that letter, she has written all the schemes of Baroque works. Karu accepts and departs rapidly. On the deck of the ship, Ace suggests to Zoro that Crocodile might have a deeper goal than just usurping the throne. Crocodile lights a cigar and talks to himself about his views on Arabasta, the Kingdom of Sand, when Miss All Sunday starts walking towards him. 
She then informs Crocodile that the billion ships that were at the port town of Nanohana have been all wiped out by a single person, and that they are confirming the information just as they speak. Crocodile tells Miss All Sunday that they have more volunteers to billions, but if someone tries to get in his way, she should crush them. Miss All Sunday responds that she has already sent the Aramaki runners to contact the others. The Straw Hats arrive at the desert and Chopper comments that he bets it will be hot. Nami answers him by telling him that it gets over 50 Deji in the desert. Sanji sees that Nami and Vivi have full clothes now and is upset that they changed their clothes. Vivi tells him that any exposed skin in the desert will result in a sunburn. Sanji then starts rolling in the deck as the other head to exit the ship. Zoro is about to drop the anchor when he sees figures inside the water. Kung Fu Dogongs get out of the water and Luffy thinks they are seals, but Vivi screams what they are. Usopp tries to fight one of them, but is defeated. Luffy defeats one, but Vivi explains that if you win, they become your pupils. Luffy starts training with them, and they want to follow him afterwards, but Vivi tell him that they cannot cross the desert. Chopper comes up with the idea of giving them food so they stay at the shore. When he takes out a piece of meat, all the Kung Fu Dugongs top Chopper. After that, the Kung Fu Dugongs are giving them a farewell with a drum and Sanji gets mad because Luffy just lowered the supplies of the straw hats. The pirates arrive to Arimalu. Vivi explains how it used to be known and why now it is a ghost town. Dance powder was used to rain in Alibarna and people called it the King's Miracle. After that, a load of the powder was sent as if the king had ordered it, making it seem like the king was provoking the droughts in surrounding towns. Luffy gets angry and destroys a building with a punch. He then tells Vivi that he is itching to complete their mission. Everyone then heads towards Yuba. The Straw Hats are on their journey to Yuba. Luffy is tired and thirsty, so the crew let him drink a mouthful of water, but he fills his cheeks to the fullest, so Nami hits him. During the night in their camp, Vivi starts talking to Ace about Luffy. Ace then tells Vivi that Luffy has always been that way since he was a child, and that he has not changed a bit. He also tells her that he always had charisma and befriends people around him. In the morning, Luffy founds an extremely poisonous scorpion, but mistakes it for a shrimp. When Vivi wakes up and sees Luffy holding the scorpion, she yells to leave it alone since a sting is extremely poisonous. They continue their journey and Luffy proposes to have lunch because he is hungry. Vivi tells him that they are only one-tenth of their way and Luffy makes up a proverb for eating. She then tells Luffy they can have a meal when they arrive to the next rocks and Luffy runs ahead. Later, Luffy invites the crew to play rock, paper, Hasami and whoever wins will carry all the equipment. He wins and starts to carry the equipment, but then complains, saying that it's unfair, since he won the game. Usopp spots the next rocks and after telling the crew, Luffy runs ahead extremely fast. As he enters the rocks, a bird lands on one of them. He starts to hear noises, so he gets further into the spot, seeing a lot of birds on the ground and moaning. He grabs one of them and says to him that he will get a doctor, rushing out for Chopper. The crew returns to the place only to find the birds are missing and their stuff all gone. Vivi explains that Warsagi are bandit birds that take advantage of travelers to steal their belongings. The birds are in front of them, showing off the things they got from them. Luffy starts chasing the birds and Vivi tell him to not do that, but he continues anyway. As he is chasing them, one bird falls and carnivorous plants start to get out of the sand. One of the plants eats Luffy, but he is able to break free. He then sees a camel that is going to be eaten by a plant and saves him after he asks him for help. After that, something big starts moving behind them. Ace apologizes for all the trouble his brother always brings, but the crew thinks it is okay. Usopp spots Luffy far away riding a camel rapidly towards them. They wonder what is chasing him until Vivi remembers there are giant lizards that wait for their prey below the sand. Zoro, Sanji, and Luffy are able to beat it, but another one appears behind Ace. The lizard is able to trap Ace in his mouth, but it then explodes with fire inside it and Ace comes out. The straw hats eat the meat of the gigantic lizard and Nami names the camel Matsuj. The camel then is willing to carry her and Vivi through the desert. Everyone then continues their journey. The straw hats are on their journey through the desert and Luffy is really thirsty. Vivi and Nami get ahead of them because they are riding Matsuj. Zoro is pulling Chopper because he cannot stand the heat. Suddenly Luffy starts seeing that a tsunami is coming and Usapeep remembers he let him drink a cactus back during their journey. Chopper realizes that it was a psychoactive cactus which causes hallucinations. Luffy tries to hit the others and Chopper injects him with a tranquilizer. Zoro is pulling Luffy and they continue their journey, but they suddenly notice they've lost sight of Nami and Vivi as well as Ace. Luffy wakes up and everyone blames him for getting lost. Usopp starts hearing something, and when they pass the dunes, a pirate ship is sailing through the sand. Usopp then sees that the pirates have captured Nami and Vivi. Luffy starts to run towards the ship and the others follow him. He then stretches his arms and he tangles them around the mast. He rams into the mast, breaking it. The mast then falls over the deck of the ship. A giant scorpion comes from below the sand in front of Ace, and he tells it not to dare do it. 
Luffy is on the deck of the ship with the pirates, telling them that he is really thirsty. Nani asks if he did not come to save them, but he says that he only came for water. The captain of the pirates walks towards Luffy and mentions that they are the Barber Pirates. He also mentions that they have a saying aside from friends, everything alive in the desert can be eaten. Luffy has a chit-chat with Barbarossa, and he later apologizes for treating Luffy's friends that way. He says that they were really hungry and wanted to eat something. Then one pirate says that they cannot leave because the main mast is broken and without it, they will not have enough thrust to go through the sand. Luffy decides to collect wood for the pirates in order to fix the ship, since he is the one responsible for breaking it. Ace is walking and the scorpion is behind him, defeated with smoke coming out of it. He then says that he warned him. Meanwhile, Luffy and Vivi are in trouble after Rasa pushed their sled into quicksand. Sanji and Zoro are working inside the ship of Barbarossa and Nami is talking with him. The Sandora Desert Bandits approach the ship's location to fight the pirates. A Sandora giant bug is carrying a large ball of dung over a dune, only to release it towards the Barbar Pirate's ship. Barbarossa tries to stop the dung after it has gained momentum, but he is quickly overcome, so Zoro cuts it into pieces and Sanji breaks the debris coming towards the ship. Meanwhile, Luffy is able to reach for the sled that Rasa is piloting in order to pull their sled back on course. Luffy and the others arrive at the oasis, only to find everything is buried. Here, they learn about Rasa's backstory. During dusk, Ace is seen riding the gecko and screams after Luffy. Luffy and his crew say their parting goodbyes to the sand pirates. As they're leaving, Zoro questions the whereabouts of Luffy's brother, Ace. Luffy claims that Ace would eventually show up out of nowhere, and the crew begins their journey to the city of Ido. Meanwhile, in Ido, a group of Kamu's rebels are having a meal with the mayor, discussing the strength of their troops and telling how the rebel and royal army would soon have to clash. Suddenly, one of Kamu's men rushes up to him, exclaiming about the arrival of sand pirates. Kamu's decision was to run and hide, to the other's surprise. As Kamu begins to walk out, the lizard that Ace was accompanying shows up and behind them Ace is sitting at the table eating their food. The men call Ace a food thief, and Ace goes on to beat the living crap out of them. Kamu watches, petrified, and bows down to Ace in fear and begs for his help against the sand pirates. Ace agrees to do so, but on a condition. While riding on the lizard to defeat the sand pirates, he runs into Luffy and his crew, saying how the rebels believed that they were sand pirates. Ace explains to Vivi how there are rebels in town, but are actually mere hoodlums. Vivi gets upset and says how there is nothing wrong with villagers wanting to protect their village, even if it means posing as rebels. She brings up the idea of testing them to see if they are strong enough to carry the burden of protecting the village on their shoulders. Camus and his men are seen hiding in barrels, questioning whether Ace had beat the sand pirates or not. As Camus begins to leave once again, all the villagers show up outside his door cheering him on for the oncoming fight against the sand pirates. The mayor walks up to them and wishes them the best against the sea pirates. Kamu is confused as he was sure they were sand pirates. The mayor then goes to show him the wanted poster of Belai 30 million on Luffy's head, and he becomes frightened. They begin to secretly devise a plan to outrun the pirates once they leave town, but as they open the gates, the straw hat pirates surround them menacingly go 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 go. The rebels stand their ground as the straw hats begin to attack. Kamu and his men decide to stop being cowards and stand their ground. Vivi is satisfied with this and signals for the straw hats to retreat. The Straw Hats, Vivi and Ace are still traveling together on their way to the Yuba Oasis. Vivi intends to meet with the rebel army there. Luffy and Usopp, thirsty and tired, began struggling with each to get a drink of water from the skin bottle. Sanji decides to save his for Nami and Vivi, but Luffy tries to take his water bottle away from him. At that point, Luffy, Usopp, and Sanji begin fighting over the water in the skin bottle. Nami asks Vivi to tell her more about the rebel army and Vivi went to tell her of the events that occurred 11 years back. A young Koza is seen before King Cobra complaining that his village is dried up and the king is doing nothing to help. The king, in turn, told him that the weather is commanded by God and that he has no power over nature. Just then, Toto arrived beseeching the king that he would accept the punishment for his rude son. Cobra promised to look after the village affected by the drought and told Toto to remain in Alibarna. Koza, still upset at the king, said the king does not understand the feelings of the people and fled his sight. Cobra then told Toto that Koza is a good child because he cares for the people and their feelings. Vivi, standing by the hallway, saw Koza running down crying and called him a crybaby. Igaram is seen telling Cobra that the country's budget will not suffice to help the whole village affected by the drought and Cobra, comically hitting him on the head, told him to take money out of their personal wallets. Just then, Vivi appeared before her father and told him she got into a fight but lost. Igaram was angry that Koza hit the princess and Toto was pleading to the king for him to commit suicide as a way of apology. Cobra told them to stay out of it for it is simply a children's quarrel. In the village, Vivi challenged Koza for the position of leader of the Sunasuna clan. After their fight, 
Koza announced Vivi as the new assistant leader of the Sunasuna clan. Igaram and Cobra were watching and hiding and Cobra commented that Vivi has made friends, which is important for the next ruler to have. Vivi, after joining the clan, became close to Koza's family. Vivi was about to be kidnapped when the Sunasuna clan launched an offensive against the kidnappers to protect Vivi. Meanwhile, in the desert, a scorpion came out from the ground and was about to attack Luffy, making Zoro, Sanji, Chopper, and Luffy all together beat the scorpion. The Sunasuna clan continued to fight the kidnappers, when a third one appeared grabbing Vivi. Vivi bit him and ran towards the ruins. Igaram and Cobra appeared after the children have been defeated and inquired on what had happened. They were told, and they went after Vivi. At the ruins, the kidnappers were looking for Vivi and one found her. Koza came from behind and hit him with a club. The kidnapper and Koza went at each other, but Koza defeated him by hitting him in the head but got cut by the kidnapper's sword near his left eye. Just then the other two arrived and when they were about to fight Koza, when Igaram and Cobra knocked them out, Hell and Shaka also defeated the rest of the kidnapping ring crew. Vivi, upon Koza's recovery, cried and told him not to give his life to save hers, after remembering their resolve to protect her. Cobra thanked Koza for his noble deed, although Koza said he did it for a friend. Cobra asked if Koza loved the country and he replied yes saying it is the country of his birth and Cobra commented that he also loves the country. Koza told Vivi about Toto accepting the position of a representative to build the oasis of Yuba into a town since it is the hub of western Arabaster. Koza told her he was leaving with his father and would help build Yuba with his own two hands. Koza, upon leaving told Vivi to become a great princess. In the present, Nami comments that Vivi's friend Koza seems like a good person and asks what that had to do with the rebels. Vivi then revealed to Nami that Koza was the leader of the rebel army. A man named Scorpion is shown sleeping on top of a large rock outlook with a bird that looks like an ostrich wearing a helmet called Popo. Food is scattered across the ground. Popo walks over to Scorpion and wakes him up. When Scorpion asks what's the matter, Popo points to rising smoke in the distance. Scorpion grabs his spyglass and points it to where the smoke is rising up. He sees the straw hats and ace. Once Scorpion realizes who it is, sweat covers his face and he gets excited. He has been waiting for the day that he finally tracked down Porcus D. Ace. The Straw Hats and Ace are eating Luffy and Usopp are asking for seconds. Sanji kicks them, telling them to stop being greedy. After hearing this, Luffy steals some from Zoro's plate. They all start fighting. Vivi starts talking to Nami and asks why every meal turns into a fight. Nami responds by telling her to ignore it. They both admire Porcus D. Ace for eating quietly and cleaning his fork and plate. He sure is different remarks Nami, comparing Ace to Luffy. Nami starts talking about how much Ace is worth, and that his bounty makes bounty hunters drool. Switching back to Scorpion, he is loading a rocket launcher and starts aiming at Ace. He says, with this one shot, I'll settle everything he lights the fuse on his rocket. Popo sneezes on the fuse, putting it out without Scorpion noticing. Nami starts getting ready to set off traveling to Yuba. She tells the rest of the Straw Hats to start getting ready by cleaning up. Two shadows appear behind some rocks without anyone noticing. Then all of a sudden a piece of meat starts to rise with no, with no one touching it. This catches Luffy's attention. It is then revealed that it is rising due to a fishing rod pulling it up. Luffy, still not noticing this, thinks that the meat is floating and talking. Once the two shadows pull the meat in, they start running away. Luffy chases after it. It is then revealed as two boys trying to get food because they are starving. They had not eaten in ten days. As they start eating it, Ace asks if they came from the Badland. They are shocked for a second that they were caught. They then get aggressive and scared of Ace, asking who are you? and saying that they won't give back the food. The eldest brother pulls out a revolver and says, One move and you're a dead man ace, does not appear to be scared. Instead, he smirks and calmly states, Dangerous things like that won't frighten me. The brother fires the weapon and ace easily deflects it. The straw hats come up behind ace asking who they are. The eldest brother drops the revolver and says, We have something to ask of you. We need you to find and capture a man. The two boys pull out a picture of Scorpion. But returning to Scorpion, he is still waiting for the fuse to go off, even though it is no longer burning. He asks if Popo is ready, but he then realizes that Popo ate the fuse. Scorpion screams at Popo as catches Luffy's attention, who is right under where they are located. Luffy hops up and starts talking to them. In the commotion, Scorpion loses track of Ace. The two boys tell Ace they have traveled all across the Badlands looking for him. Usopp asks who is the person they are looking for. Nami tells Usopp it is a bounty hunter called Scorpion. Ace tells them that he has business with Scorpion because the person who defeated Blackbeard and Yuba was called Scorpion. Luffy finds out the person he is talking to is the bounty hunter Scorpion. He tells Luffy that he is going to find and kill Fire Fist Ace. Luffy tells him that is funny and Scorpion responds by telling him don't mock me in a playful tone. The two boys realize who Ace is. They ask Ace if he is the real Ace, but he is too busy scanning the desert for something. Usopp asks if there is something wrong. He responds by saying, two men and a bird. 
Scorpion rides up with Luffy and says, I am Scorpion and I am going to defeat you. He is very nervous, and it is obvious he is faking everything. They set up a true battle between him and Ace. Scorpion shoots a net at Ace, but he knocks it away back onto Scorpion. Then Ace quickly punches and defeats him. Ace tells Scorpion that he could not have defeated Blackbeard because he is too weak. The eldest boy yells, that is enough. Dad, everyone is surprised that Scorpion is their father. It turns out that they were originally farmers. Once the drought set in their farm died, the father told his children that he would become a bounty hunter, take down Ace, and return rich. His children now tell him that he is no match for Fire Fist Ace. He chuckles and nervously says, What are you saying? Your dad is now the world's greatest bounty hunter. Scorpion gives a speech to his children and returns to the fight. His children beg him not to. Just as he is about to launch the rocket, his children tell him to stop. He drops the rocket. It goes off and hits a rock. The rock explodes, sending smaller rocks towards them. Ace then saves all three of them from a certain death. They then return home to the Badlands. At the end of all of this, Ace leaves. Before he leaves, he gives Luffy a piece of paper and tells Luffy that next time they see each other, it will be at the top of Pirate's Summit. This episode starts off with Luffy hallucinating because of dehydration. The crew is very confused on what he is doing, as he runs around the desert screaming random names. Nami tells Zoro to get Chopper, but they see Chopper has collapsed because of the heat. Since Chopper has collapsed and cannot help Luffy, Nami tells Zoro to take care of Luffy. When Zoro starts walking towards Luffy to get him, Nami and the rest of the crew start off again, as they want to get to Yuba as fast as possible. When they start off, Vivi thinks to herself that Luffy, Zoro, and Chopper probably will not be alright, foreshadowing that they will not be. Zoro approaches Luffy, dragging Chopper, and tells Luffy to calm down. Luffy, who is throwing punches at his hallucinogenic enemies, mistakes Zoro as Crocodile. He punches Zoro very hard, invoking Zoro to start fighting back. Zoro does not want to hurt Luffy, so he puts his swords away. He starts the beginning of a fist fight. The two continue throwing punches until they both punch each other very hard. This knocks both of them out. They collapse unconscious into the desert sand. Chopper then wakes up confused on what happened, as he was asleep when they were fighting. Chopper runs over to where Zoro and Luffy are and wakes Zoro up using a pungent-smelling medicine. Zoro asks Chopper where the group is, and Chopper replies telling him they were gone when he arose. At first, Zoro says they will just follow the group's footprints, but then he realizes the desert wind will have eroded them away. The scene then changes to Nami and Vivi in an ancient ruin. Vivi remarks how kingdoms change and fade away, that civilizations grow and die on this land, but the people stay the same. It is clear that she is afraid that her father's kingdom will fall to Baroque works and become a fading kingdom. Nami tells her not to worry, that Luffy will take them down along with Crocodile. Vivi agrees, but she is still worried. Back to Luffy, Chopper, and Zoro. After a while, Luffy wakes up and is confused on why they are alone. Zoro punches him, telling Luffy that it is his fault and now they are lost. They set off in a random direction. Once Luffy realizes what happened, he starts complaining. Zoro and Chopper walk on ahead. They start talking about why each one joined the crew. Chopper remarks that the crew seems so wild compared to him. Zoro then starts talking about how everyone has different goals, and their goals to be the best in what they do unite them. While they are still talking, Luffy spots some shade and uses his rubber arm rockets to propel the three of them to the cave. Zoro sits on a rock that turns into a sinkhole. He falls into a cavern. He spots the Poneglyph and wonders what it is. Luffy and Chopper then both fall into the cavern and join Zoro. When their eyes have adjusted, they realize they are in a dome built by humans. Zoro, Luffy, and Chopper decide to leave and catch up with the rest of the group. Luffy swings his arm trying to get up and out of the underground dome, but misses making it slowly collapse. He finally succeeds and zooms out of the dome. They are sent flying into the sky. When they land, Chopper smells that the wind has changed. He catches wind of Nami's perfume. They head off in that direction to meet up with the group. The perspective changes back to the rest of the group. Nami and Vivi start talking about Luffy and how the crew came about. Nami says that in the pirate crew, each person has an ability. Zoro has his swords, Nami is a navigator, Usopp is the liar, Luffy is the fighter, Chopper is the doctor, and Sanji is the cook. Each one of them plays a crucial role in the fabric of the Straw Hat Pirates, and without each and every one of them doing their role, the crew would fall apart. This is how they can trust each other, through the fact that they know each one of them has some unique trait that allows them to be able to get through anything. Vivi is impressed with her answer and overall likes that theory. She turns her head and sees Luffy, Chopper, and Zoro coming over the horizon. She now knows Nami is right, that she does not have to worry because each crew member is powerful and loyal, Luffy looking at the piece of paper Ace gave him. He ponders what it is and why Ace gave it to him. The rest of the crew also look at it and also conclude that it is just a piece of paper. Since it is so important to Luffy, Nami sews it on the inside of his hat. 
Vivi is looking onward and tells the rest of the crew that Yuba is only past the distant rock. Meanwhile, in Crocodile's lair, he and Miss All Sunday are discussing their plan. Miss All Sunday says that all preparations are in place, and they can carry out the plan in two days. Crocodile is pleased and tells her the other agents are coming from Spider Cafe to meet them. In Spider Cafe, agents start gathering. The only one left is Mr. One. The other agents start getting impatient and just want to leave. Mr. Two and his men put on a dance show, but all of a sudden Mr. One bursts through the wall, knocking over one of Mr. Two's men. Mr. Two and Mr. One start fighting because Mr. Two is angry that he knocked over one of his men like that. Miss Doublefinger quickly puts an end to it. She says that they received word to go to Rain Base and meet the boss. They all go into a carriage that starts off. Luffy and his group finally make it to Yuba. It is being ravaged by a sandstorm. After it stops, they can see that it has been abandoned. Yuba is not the oasis they were expecting. The only one left is the founder of Yuba, and they find out the rebel army has relocated to Kataria. When Luffy calls Vivi over the old man recognizes her, he runs over to her and she realizes he is Toto from her youth. His son is the rebel army's leader. It is clear that he is very loyal to the crown and feels terrible that his son is leading the revolution. There is then a flashback of Vivi and his son playing together when they are younger. Toto is tasked with starting a new city called Yuba, and so the son and Vivi part ways. Vivi and Toto have a strong connection. Since Vivi and Toto know each other, Prue decides to stay in Yuba for the night. Toto shares stories of how great Yuba was before the three years of drought. They all fall asleep, but not before deciding they will set off in the morning. In Yuba, Luffy learns that Toto was entrusted by Cobra to watch over the land and figures out a way to stop the sandstorm. At rain dinners, the officer agents learn that their leader, Mr. Zero, is actually Crocodile and learn that they are going to overthrow the country during the war. Mr. Three appears and reveals that the Straw Hats are alive. As a punishment for his failure to kill them, Crocodile dries him up and drops him into a Bananawani pit. All Sunday tell the rebel army to kill everyone on sight. Meanwhile, the Straw Hats depart to Kataria, but Luffy stops. When Luffy tells Vivi of his plan to defeat Crocodile and denounces Vivi's plan to stop the rebellion as naive, the two get into a struggle. During this, Vivi reveals that she will only risk her own life. Luffy, however, says that she should be putting their lives on the line together and to trust her friends and Vivi is moved to tears by his statement. Vivi, still in tears, declares that their plans of stopping the rebellion have changed to finding Crocodile. Nami states that this seems to be the quickest way of stopping the fighting from happening. Vivi takes out a map of Arabasta and shows them Ali Barna's location, the capital of Arabasta where her father is, and Kataria, where the rebel army is camped. Sanji supposes that they have to get to Crocodile before the rebels invade Ali Barna. She also shows them where Crocodile lives, which is Rain Base, and tells them it is a day's journey from where they are. On their way to Rain Base, Usopp asks for a sip of Luffy's water given to him by Toto, but Luffy refuses to give Usopp any since the old man had to dig all night to fill the container, and that they can't just drink it like it is regular water. Meanwhile, in the rebel base in Kataria, a boy is begging the leader of the rebel army, Koza, to join the fight. Koza dissuades the boy, but he remains determined, stating he wants to fight. Koza then says that that is the reason he can't let the boy join them, because none of the rebels want to fight, and that the only reason they do is because they have to. Koza tells the boy to leave, and then starts to discuss their plans to invade Ali Barna with his men. Once they have gathered all the weapons they need from all the rebel towns, they will then begin their all-out attack on the capital. In Ali Barna, Shaka suggests to Cobra that they must take action towards the rebel army before they attack the capital. Cobra angrily refuses to attack the rebels that in doing so would be the true destruction of their kingdom. He recalls the dance powder incident and surmises that since that incident, someone has been trying to tear apart their country, and that before they should act, they must determine who is really behind all of it. Chaka argues that whoever is behind it has not made himself known, and that they cannot sit back and wait for whoever it is to divide them, to which the king remained adamant in his refusal to act. While Chaka and Pell discuss Vivi and Igram's efforts to determine the mastermind of the turmoil within their kingdom, the palace guard informs them that Karu has returned. They rush to see Karu and find Cobra reading the letter Vivi wrote informing him that Crocodile is without a doubt the person who is trying to destroy Arabasta Kingdom. She tells them that Igaram died protecting her. Furthermore, she says that she has teamed up with an amazing group of people who will help her save Arabasta. Having learned of the identity of the mastermind behind their country's troubles, Cobra orders his forces to march onto Rainbase. Chaka and Pell discourage this plan, saying that they will have to plan the attack and that Crocodile has the hearts of some of the citizens, even more than the king. Moreover, they are worried that the absence of the royal army from the capital will make it vulnerable to the rebel army's occupation. Cobra replies that he doesn't care if the rebels destroy the palace since it is only a building. It doesn't matter that the royal army falls in the end, as long as Crocodile is defeated, the country can still be reborn. But if they battle the rebel army, 
Crocodile will win. They start preparations to take down Crocodile, with Chaka readying the War Council and Pell scouting ahead to conduct reconnaissance. Meanwhile, in Rainbase, Luffy's group have finally arrived. They plan to lay low since they are under the assumption that Crocodile already knows they are on the island. However, Luffy and Usa loudly enter a bar where Smoker and Tashiji are staying and inadvertently sit right beside them. At first, they go unnoticed, but eventually the two parties see each other, so Luffy and Usopp run away and are chased by the Marines. They lead the Marines to the other crew members minus Chopper, so their plan of laying low is no longer feasible. The group decides to split up and just meet at Rain Dinners, the casino where Crocodile is. Chopper, after going to the restroom, returns to where everyone was but sees that they are gone. He determines that everyone's split up when he finds everyone's scent coming from different directions. Vivi and Zoro are chased down by Marines, but Zoro lets Vivi go ahead without him. Usopp, he, Nami, and Sanji are also pursued by Marines, but Sanji asks Usopp to protect Nami so he can deal with the Marines. Nami and Usopp arrive at rain dinners and find Zoro there. Luffy arrives shortly after, again being chased by Smoker. The four of them decide to enter the casino without the others in order to escape Smoker. Inside, Crocodile and Miss All Sunday find out of the Straw Hat's arrival and plan to give them a warm welcome. Luffy, Zoro, Nami, and Usopp run towards the Rain Dinner's casino. They know that without Vivi, they do not know what Crocodile looks like and realize that Vivi is not there with them. They start shouting for both Vivi and Crocodile but realize this is useless. Smoker catches up to them and chases them inside the casino, but the casino security personnel stop him saying that government employees are not allowed in the casino. He persists in chasing after the group and the ruckus causes casino security to try and also stop Luffy's group. They are unable to contain the commotion so the manager... Miss All Sunday tells the personnel to send them to the VIP room. The group is led to the VIP room and Smoker continues to give chase. Inside, the hallway is split into two, with a sign saying that VIPs should go to the left and pirates should go to the right. The group decides to go to the right, being that they are pirates. This leads to a dead end and a trap door. The trap door opens and the group, along with Smoker, fall down said trap door. Meanwhile, Chopper is still looking for his crewmates and sees Tashiji. He realizes that the Marines are after the Straw Hats and tries to stop her. However, Tashigi bumps into him and falls on top of him, her glasses also falling onto Chopper's eyes. Chopper becomes disoriented and dizzy due to the prescription of Tashigi's eyeglasses. Tashigi, unable to see without them, does not recognize Chopper who has fallen down. Sanji sees this and hides. Chopper gives back her glasses, but she still does not recognize him. Sanji and Chopper are reunited. In the casino, Luffy's group and Smoker are inside a prison cell. Luffy notices that something is wrong as he is feeling weak all of a sudden. Smoker then hits Luffy with his jit, causing Luffy to fall and feel helpless like he's falling into the sea. Smoker explains that the tip of his weapon is made of sea prism stone, which is a rare mineral that gives off a mystical energy with the same wavelength as the ocean or basically a solid form of the sea. It affects devil fruit users the same way as if they have fallen into the ocean. As Zoro is about to attack Smoker for attacking Luffy, Crocodile interrupts and tells them to try to get along since they are about to die together anyway. Crocodile tells Smoker that he knows he is there on his own without orders from the government, since he knows the government trusts him completely, being a warlord of the sea. Crocodile then proceeds to tell them that he will deal with them after their guest of honor arrives. Meanwhile, outside Vivi is fending off Baroque Works billions, and she is knocked down and about to be captured. Shortly after, bullets rain down on the billions from the sky. Pell then swoops down and carries Vivi to safety. L updates Vivi on her father's plans and then eliminates the billions who were after her. Just as she is about to leave and find the straw hats, Miss All Sunday appears saying that she has been invited to a gathering. Vivi attacks her but is overpowered and falls down. Pell tries to take her down but Miss All Sunday manages to use her Hana Hana no my devil fruit powers and overpowers him too. Miss All Sunday then takes Vivi to the casino. Back inside the prison cell, Luffy's group and Crocodile wait for Vivi and Miss All Sunday to arrive. Vivi arrives and tries to attack Crocodile, but her attack is ineffective as Crocodile has turned into sand. Crocodile reveals that he has eaten the Sunasuna no my fruit, which turns him into a sand human. Crocodile then has Vivi sit down and states that the party is about to begin. Miss All Sunday then agrees and tells everyone that it is already to ask what this was. Crocodile then says that Operation Utopia means the demise of the Kingdom of Arabasta. Baroque Works' plan to take over Arabasta is set in motion. Crocodile begins explaining to Vivi what Operation Utopia is. The king is kidnapped and replaced by Bentham who announces that he must eliminate the town of Nanohana and all of its inhabitants to prevent word of the dance powder incident that occurred earlier in the same city from reaching the marines. But as soon as Bentham gives the order to destroy Nanohana, Koza arrives to confront him. After a brief exchange, Koza attempts to attack Bentham, but is stopped by two royal guards and then shot, allowing the royal army to attack Nanohana. 
Koza, badly wounded, wonders why the rebel army fought. In the midst of the fight, Mr. One and Miss Doublefinger crash into Nanohana on a giant pirate ship they had commandeered by killing everyone on board. The ship then causes massive collateral damage, forcing the city's inhabitants to flee. Bentham then announces that his part of the mission is complete and tells the royal army to burn the city. While fleeing, it is shown that the royal soldiers in Nanohana were actually billions under Bentham's command. Meanwhile, the citizens of Nanohana admit they cannot put out the fire. Koza, still badly wounded, is dragged out of the fire by two rebel army soldiers. The same two rebel soldiers find a boy, who after discovering that someone had impersonated Cobra, was attacked by Mr. One and Miss Doublefinger. The boy tries to tell them that the king wasn't responsible but is too wounded to speak, and the rebels are framed for the crime. Koza orders the rebel army to move. When one of the rebel soldiers says they don't have enough weapons, another soldier says that the ship that just crashed was an armory ship. Koza proclaims that is like divine guidance. Back at the palace, Chaka is astonished at the Nanohana incident, and is told by a royal soldier that all of Arabasta is headed towards the palace. Back at Rainbase Crocodile has just finished explaining his plan to Vivi, who is shocked into silence. Eventually, Vivi regains some spirit and attempts to escape with her hands still tied. Chaka orders the royal guards to attack the rebels in order to protect Arabasta. Meanwhile, Koza and the rebels head to Alibarna. The Straw Hat pirates are still locked up in Crocodile's cell. Crocodile taunts the tied-up Vivi with a key to get the locked-up pirates. Vivi is able to get free from the ropes, but the key that Crocodile had accidentally slips from his hands and goes through his trap door where one of his many banana crocodiles eats it. Mr. Zero gives everyone in his VIP room one hour to live due to water filling the room. Before he is able to leave with Miss all Sunday, Crocodile gets a call on his responder snail from Mr. Prince who the Straw Hats recognizes Sanji. Vivi leaves to get Sanji and Chopper to help save the rest of the Straw Hat pirates. The bridge of the casino collapses before Princess Vivi can leave, trapping her inside the casino. But Sanji says that he didn't do it to keep her trapped inside, but rather to keep the Baroque works out of the casino. Chopper distracts Crocodile while Sanji frees the rest of the crew. Smoker reveals to the Straw Hats that Miss All Sunday is a wanted woman, and that the world government has been chasing after her for 20 years, along with a bounty of 70 million almost as much as Crocodile's. Sanji beats up a few banana gators to get the key to the cell. But instead of getting the key, the straw hats see Mr. Three pop out of an alligator's stomach. Mr. Three retrieves the key and then throws it in the middle of three banana gators. While Crocodile and Miss All Sunday are speaking, Crocodile reveals that he had the real key to the cell all along. Asap has an idea where they could use Mr. Three's devil fruit powers to get them out. By the time Crocodile and Miss All Sunday get back to the room, they see that the straw hats and Smoker have left the cell. After Luffy tells Zoro to save Smoker, he lets the straw hats off while the rest of the marines chase after them. The crew runs away while Luffy says that they are not going to stop running until they reach Alibarna. The Straw Hat pirates are seen escaping to the east from pursuing marines. However, Smoker calls them off, claiming that he is tired and that they won't catch them. Smoker then tells a subordinate to order for backup from surrounding marine warships straight to Arabasta. Chopper and Matsuj seen riding a huge crab creature called a moving crab towards the scent of Nami's perfume. Apparently, Matsuj is friends with several animals including the moving crab. However, as the straw hats, Vivi, Matsuj, and the moving crab head towards Alibarna, Crocodile's hook latches onto Vivi, pulling her away. Luffy, in a split-second decision, grabs onto Vivi to switch places with her and follows the hook back to Crocodile. Before engaging with the man, though, Luffy orders the others to head straight to Alibarna without him and to get Vivi home. Finally, with one last promise to meet in Alibarna, Luffy engages Crocodile and Miss All Sunday. Luffy then addresses how kind Vivi is in her selflessness and entirety to protect her entire kingdom and solve the conflict without bloodshed. Crocodile says how hers is a foolish belief and asks if Luffy agrees with him. He does. However, Luffy claims that as long as Crocodile lives, Vivi will suffer, and as her friend, Luffy would stop him here. Crocodile claims that this makes Luffy an even bigger fool for becoming intimate with others, and as such he will die for it. After a taunt towards Crocodile, Miss All Sunday laughs and Crocodile asks if he should kill her too, calling her by her real name Nico Robin. Robin then tells him to do as he wishes, even though he has broken his promise to never call her by that name. She then leaves, claiming to go to Olibarna. His patience thinning, Crocodile places down a sand timer with a limit of three minutes saying that he only has that much time to play with Luffy. Luffy claims that it is fine with him and starts his offense with his Gomu Gomu no pistol attack. Crocodile evades by predictably evaporating into sand. Crocodile lunges forward with his hook when Luffy narrowly ducks the attack. Luffy's next attack to Crocodile's back. Gomu Gomu no stamp is also thwarted as Crocodile's Suna Suna no Mai's abilities which seem to be impervious to physical attack. 
This is shown again by a futile Gomu Gomu no Gatling gun, each attack passing through him, a Gomu Gomu no Bazooka blasting sand everywhere, and an axe kick that does no damage. However, as Crocodile continues to try and explain to Luffy why he will never win, Luffy cuts him off by clocking his face with a haymaker that, although doing no physical damage, shuts Crocodile up and enrages him. Before the three minutes are up, Crocodile decides he is done playing with Luffy, even though Luffy says to have been fighting seriously the whole time. He then shows off his first impressive attack desert spout a desert sword in Italian. It sends a blade of sand towards Luffy that he once again narrowly dodges. Crocodile compliments Luffy on his quick reflexes and claims that had it hit him, he would have certainly died. Crocodile finally explains to Luffy why he will never win. Unlike Luffy, Crocodile trained his devil fruit powers to the point of mastering them. He claims that any devil fruit power can be powerful in a fight as long as someone knows how to use them properly. Crocodile says to Luffy that if he has proper training, his skills can be as formidable as any, but claims that Luffy's not there yet, just like all the other fools who waste time obsessing over their abilities. Crocodile attacks again instantly afterwards with Desert Girasol Desert Sunflower, creating a large pit of quicksand where Luffy was standing. He escapes, however, with another bazooka. This is when Crocodile seems to get deadly serious. As Luffy futilely continues to attack him, Crocodile uses Barchan, which completely dehydrates Luffy's right arm. In a comedic fashion, Luffy remembers the water from Yuba and drinks from it, restoring his arm quickly. Luffy then attacks in a quite familiar fashion to the former king of Drum Kingdom, Wapple, by using Gomu Gomu no Baku Baku to chomp off the top part of Crocodile. Crocodile dodges, but is infuriated by Luffy's attack. The three minutes from the sand timer have run out as well. Crocodile prepares his last attack, Sable's Sandstorm, to finish Luffy. However, it seems as if it was not actually intended for Luffy, but for Yuba to the south, for the wind blows from north to south. Luffy, enraged at Crocodile's cruelty, asks why. Luffy, for whatever reason, thinks talking Crocodile and the sandstorm down will make it go away. Crocodile impales Luffy with his hook right in the middle of his ranting. Water has reached Yuba and Toto is relieved. Another sandstorm is caused by Crocodile. Meanwhile, Crocodile pierces Luffy in his stomach and tells him he failed. Luffy is bleeding some water caused by the one he drank earlier to rehydrate his arm. Luffy grabs his arm heavily and Crocodile is surprised he is still alive. He throws Luffy into the quicksand and heads to a Libarna. The rest of the Straw Hats are riding on Hasami. Usopp is telling Chopper one of his stories and Zoro is working out by using Matsuge as a dumbbell. Zoro and Sanji argue with each other because Sanji thinks Zoro is scared. Nami hits them and says it's not the time to fool around. Vivi believes in Luffy and says he will meet them in Alibarna. She was the one who was worried the most. Nami bonks her on the head and says she worries about the rebellion. Smoker orders Tashidi to go to Alibarna. She has to decide whether to pursue the Straw Hats or support the Royal Army while Smoker goes out to sea. Smoker says he will accept responsibility for whatever choice she makes. Nami and the others have to cross a wide river if they want to make it to Alibarna. Hasami cannot cross the ocean, so they decide to make him speed up enough to run on the water. Nami motivates Hasami by using her dancing outfit to make him run across the ocean since Hasami likes dancer girls. They reach three-fourths across the ocean when Hasami sinks down into the sea. They swim back up and they are attacked by a sea monster, who is quickly defeated by the Kung Fu Dogongs. The Kung Fu Dogongs reply that they would never disobey their master's will Luffy. They reach shore and see something coming after them in the distance. It is revealed to be Karu and the Super Spot build duck troops. Luffy is stuck in the middle of the quicksand and tries to struggle out, but is being covered in the sand. Nico Robin saves him by using her Hana Hana Know My Powers and asks him about the will of the D, also having retrieved Luffy's hat. Pell arrives, still injured, and asks Nico Robin what she did to Vivi. She replies that Luffy saved her and that she is safe, telling Pell to aid Luffy. While she leaves, Luffy grabs onto Pell while yelling for meat. Back in Alibarna, the royal guards are preparing for battle. The king is shown to have been kidnapped by Mr. Four and Miss Merry Christmas, as he expresses not wanting Chaka and Koza to fight. Igaram is shown to be still alive. Luffy is with Pell, and he continues to tell Pell that he needs meat. Since Luffy is badly injured from his last encounter with Crocodile, Pell tells him that he does not need food, he needs a doctor right away. But Luffy pulls his clothing and tells him that he will make Crocodile pay for what he did to Vivi and Toto. Meanwhile, the rebel army is still on their way to Alibarna to attack the royal army. The elite members of Baroque Works wait for Vivi and the rest of the Straw Hat Pirates to show up. Unexpectedly, Mr. Four spots them approaching Alibarna on ducks, who are part of the Super Spot Build Duck Troops or Hakuichi. Vivi and the Straw Hats are all wearing similar cloaks, so it is difficult for the Baroque Works members to spot which one is Vivi. Vivi and the Straw Hats split up in different directions, which forces the Baroque Works members to split up as well. After everyone is successfully broken into groups, the people on the ducks reveal who they are. 
but Princess Vivi is not in any of the groups. She did not run off with everyone else. Vivi and Karu stand outside of Alibarna City in order to stop the rebel army and the royal army from fighting with each other. Koza sees someone in front of the city but thinks he is hallucinating. Then a cannon was shot prematurely by a royal army guard, who is actually a member of the Baroque Works team. Vivi and Karu are still standing but cannot see what is in front of them because of all the dust. Vivi shouts to Koza, yelling leader a name Koza had since they were kids. Koza hears it but still thinks he is imagining things during the commotion. Vivi is knocked over and sees that there are camels coming her way. Karu acts quickly and covers her with his body and instead of her getting trampled he got trampled. Vivi gets up and sees what he did and begins to cry and tells Karu that she will stop it no matter what. Osop appears on a horse, but it is actually Mr. 2. Vivi notices that it isn't actually Osop because he calls Karu. That bird Vivi does not believe that the real Usopp would call Karu that after as much as they had been through on Little Garden. She then tells the fake Usopp to prove himself with the bandage that the crew had wrapped around their arms in previous episodes. The scene then goes to Sanji telling the real Usopp and Matsush to wake up because they had been beaten up and knocked out. It goes to a flashback of how they set up the bandages to identify the real members of their team. Mr. Two reveals that he isn't really Usopp, but that Crocodile told the elite members of Baroque Works that all the Straw Hat Pirates had bandages on their arms. Sanji realizes that Vivi is in trouble and that Mr. Two had went after her. He tells Usopp to go and help Chopper at the southeast gate, but Sanji is caught in between a fight with the Royal Army and Rebel Army. He tells both sides that he is not with either side and beats up both sides to get to Princess Vivi, telling both groups that he only fights for the ladies. Chopper is caught in a fight with the team of Miss Merry Christmas and Mr. 4. Mr. 2 attempts to kill Vivi, but Karu gets up in time to get her on his back and run away, although he is not in a good condition to run fast. Karu runs up a cliff and is unable to reach the top, which is only a step away. But he remembers when Luffy told him that Vivi is the Straw Hat's friend, and he flaps his wings and reaches the top. Although Mr. 2 begins to run up the cliff too. Karu gets hit with a stray bullet from the fighting and is no longer able to run. After falling, Karu tells Vivi to run by signaling with his wing because Mr. 2 is getting closer. Out of nowhere, two other members of the Duck Troops show up and Sanji is with them. Sanji is left to fight Mr. 2 and the two members of the Duck Troops take care of the injured Karu. Zoro and Nami are left with Mr. 1 and Miss Doublefinger. Nami and the Ducks cheer Zoro on because they believe he is going to fight the Baroque Works members. But they walk past Zoro and go straight for Nami as they believe that the weakest opponent should be taken out first. Nami tries to talk her way out of it but realizes that they will not back down so she runs away. Usopp finds Chopper laying on the ground and wakes him up. Chopper tells Usopp that Miss Merry Christmas ate the mole mole fruit so she is able to go underground and that Mr. 4 is very strong. Usopp and Chopper are left to dodge the bombs that Mr. 4 continues to hit towards them. Chopper is able to move Usopp out of the way from the exploding baseballs. Usopp disappears inside of Miss. Merry Christmas mole holes and emerges to hit Mr. 4 over the head with a fake 5 ton hammer. Usopp begins to play whack a mole with Miss Merry Christmas. Usopp and Chopper continue to fight the pair as Vivi is still running to try and stop the rebellion. Miss Merry Christmas tries to attack Usopp from underground. Chopper gets hit by Mr. 4 because he was paying too much attention to Usopp and Miss Merry Christmas battle. Chopper finds a way to defeat Mr. 4 and Miss. Merry Christmas using Mr. Four's dog lasso. Miss Merry Christmas has informed Usopp that Luffy is dead. While she and Mr. Four are glad that Luffy is gone, Usopp refuses to accept it. The mole-like woman swings Usopp along the ground and Mr. Four takes his hit. Even so, Usopp is still standing and believes Luffy is still alive. Before Mr. Four and Miss Merry Christmas continue, Usopp obstructs their vision with smoke, then Chopper tricks Mr. Four into hitting his partner. Usopp then slingshots a hammer right into the giant Baroque Works agent from Chopper's horns. One of Mr. Four's baseballs then puts the Baroque Works pair out. In the city, the fighting worsens and Koza is feeling unfazed by the bullet he took in Nanohana. He then plans to force Cobra to surrender. Vivi races to warn her father but if she can't reach him, wishes to speak with Chaka. Meanwhile, Mr. Two is fighting Sanji in the streets. He then attempts to distract Sanji with a swan ballet. Much of their attacks barely affect one another. Bon Clay uses his clone clone powers to rearrange his own face, but Sanji dislikes it. He then tries to use Usopp's face, but the cook doesn't fall for it. Bon Clay believes his soul is refined. He then shifts his face into Nami's rapidly which catches Sanji's attention. Vivi arrives at the palace to stop Chaka's fighting. She then wants the palace destroyed. Chaka shakes for a moment, but then accepts her orders. The battle between Mr. Two and Sanji continues forward with Sanji appearing to be outmatched after being hoodwinked by Bon Kuri transforming continuously into Nami. 
Eventually, with determination, Sanji is able to see that Bon Kuri has to become himself to be able to perform his ballet. Meanwhile, at the palace, Vivi is determined to ensure that the palace is blown up in order to get the attention of the rebels. Chaka has been convinced and Vivi remembers her time with the crew. Back within Chopper's care, Asapi is badly hurt and believed to be dying when Chopper admits he hid the manju bun so that Usopp couldn't eat it, and now he wants to share half with Usopp. However, this reinvigorates Usopp, who is hungry and determined to fight for the entire manju bun, wide awake and just fine after the battle, punching Chopper away. The scene cuts back to a panicking Zoro, angry at Nami for not hiding when he warned her to because Mr. One and his partner have determined to kill Nami first because the weakest is easier to beat. Here we learn the story of how Zoro was first faced with Mr. One and invited to join Baroque works as well as learn about Mr. One and his blade blade fruit abilities that allow him to turn his entire body into blades. Vivi cannot believe that Luffy is dead. Crocodile proceeds to tell her that Luffy would have still been alive had he not gotten involved with her. Vivi refuses to believe this and demands that Crocodile tell her where Luffy is. Meanwhile, the battle between the rebels and the royal army is still going on. Nami remarks that Vivi's plan to stop the rebel army at the entrance must have failed. She wonders if Vivi and the others are all right as they are all fighting while she is running and hiding. She thinks back to the day where she asks Usopp to make her a weapon so she can be strong enough not to endanger the others. Being a couple of ordinary humans with no special abilities, she says she knows that Usopp can empathize with her. Usopp agrees to make her weapon. Miss Doublefinger finds Nami while she is hiding and stabs her shoulder using her Tagi Itdh no My abilities which allows her to grow spikes on any part of her body. Nami takes out her climb attack and decides to fight her as she recalls Usopp telling her the features of her new weapon that has elemental powers. She tries her first move, Fine Tempo, which made doves appear. She is disappointed as this attack is nothing more than a party trick. She remains optimistic thinking that at least the move has caught the enemy off guard. She tries her second move, Cloudy Tempo, which causes flowers to spout when a button is pushed. Miss Doublefinger, seeing Nami's weak attempts to attack her, feels sorry for her but proceeds to attack her with her spikes. Nami barely dodges her but is determined to fight back. She drops her climb attack, but seeing no threat from Nami's weapon, Miss Doublefinger gives it back to her. Nami launches her third move, Thunder Tempo, where a boxing glove springs from the weapon. Miss Doublefinger loses patience and attacks Nami, which she dodges. She hides and continues to read the climb attack instructions, desperate to find a move that can damage her enemy. She finds battle configurations at the back of the instructions. She discovers each of the three batons of her weapon have special qualities. The first can create hot air, emitting a hot ball. The second can create cool air, emitting a cool ball. And the third can create electricity, emitting a thunderball. She tests this out, but Usopp's instructions state that these features have not yet been perfected but can be used at parties. Miss Doublefinger proceeds to attack Nami again and she runs away. Nami is stabbed on her calf and she falls down. Just as Miss Doublefinger is about to give the finishing blow, Nami swings her climb attack and she unintentionally uses the cyclone tempo the effect of which is like a boomerang. As she is studying her weapon, Nami has her back turn against her enemy which insults Miss Doublefinger and causes her to attack Nami. Nami is seemingly skewered by the attack, but a dove flies towards the skewered Nami revealing that it was just an illusion. Nami explains that she used the Mirage Tempo where her climb attack allowed her to create a mirage of herself. Finally getting a better understanding of how the climb attack works, Nami tells Miss Doublefinger that she is now ready to actually fight. Meanwhile, Crocodile has taken Cobra and nails him to the palace walls. Vivi and Chaka are unable to do anything. He tells them that he has no intention of keeping Cobra or Vivi alive and will kill them after he gets what he has really been after since the very beginning. He then asks Cobra where the Pluton is. Cobra is shocked by this question and demands to know how Crocodile knows this name. Crocodile reveals his true motive and explains the details of Pluton. After hearing of this for the first time, King Cobra informs Crocodile that even the existence of the weapon is in doubt. Crocodile affirms that even he cannot confirm its existence but reveals his backup plan. Crocodile informs Vivi and Cobra that he has planted a bomb to explode in the palace square at 4.30, one and a half hours after the rebel army and the royal guard clash at the square. Crocodile then instead asks for the location of the poneglyph from Cobra, who agrees to go with Crocodile and take him to the location. Enraged, Chaka prepares to attack Crocodile. Elsewhere, Nami attempts to further understand the climb attack and reads Usopp's instructions on the special tornado tempo attack as Miss Doublefinger continues her attack. Nami considers the options ahead of her and uses many of the features of the climb attack to the amusement of Miss Doublefinger, who continues to attack Nami as she tries to buy more time for her strategy. Outside Alibarna, Sanji meets up with Usopp and Chopper and returns Usopp's goggles that he took from Mr. 2. They all meet up with Matsuji and decide to continue towards the palace to help Vivi. At the Alibarna North block, Miss Doublefinger continues to attack Nami, 
leaving her injured and bleeding, but Nami buys enough time to create a thundercloud and launches an electric shock on Miss Doublefinger. Angry and injured, Miss Doublefinger again attacks Nami, at which point Nami reveals her Mirage Tempo ability, which manipulates the humidity of the atmosphere to create mirages. This allows Nami to go behind Miss Doublefinger and remember the information from Usopp that warns her that Tornado Tempo is a one time attack only. Nami remembers the dangers the crew has been through and resolves to continue fighting for Vivi's sake, but her injured leg is causing her to falter. Seeing an opportunity, Miss Doublefinger attacks with her sea urchin stinger, and Nami stops the attack with her leg. Nami launches the Tornado Tempo, which initially does not do anything, but then wraps around Miss Doublefinger and launches her through buildings, ending the fight in Nami's victory. In another location, Zoro and Mr. One are clashing and Zoro recalls that Mr. One used to be a famous assassin in West Blue. They clash and Zoro realizes that Mr. One's body is as hard as steel, exclaiming that he can not yet cut still but has been waiting for an opportunity like this to grow stronger. Rurono Zoro is struggling in his fight against Mr. One due to his inability to cut through steel. After a prolonged battle where Zoro displays a wide variety of techniques against the assassin, he thinks back back to when his old mentor said that a swordsman who can cut nothing can cut anything including steel. Still not understanding this idea, he is forced onto the defensive from Mr. One's attacks, which climax with the latter creating multiple spinning blades on his arms, landing a direct hit on the swordsman. Unable to defend against it, Zoro falls against a pillar in Mr. One delivers what he believes is the final blow that further wounds Zoro and destroys the pillar he was leaning on, causing the pillar and arch fall on top of him. Mr. One begins to walk away but quickly notices that Zoro has gotten up once again. Wondering out loud how Zoro was able to dodge all the flying debris, the swordsman claims that he did not dodge at all, and that he just was able to sense where no debris was falling and went there. Further elaborating to himself, Zoro notes that he can sense the rhythm of all things around him, and can tell where his sword is, turning over a stone to find it. Picking it up, he then turns and slashes at some leaves on a tree without cutting them before then cutting a rock clean in half. Finally coming to an understanding of his teacher's words, he then attacks Mr. One with only one sword. Zoro then proves he is finally able to cut Mr. One and defeats him, collapsing to the ground and wonders if everyone else is okay. The two Megari guards charge into the palace to attempt to save Cobra. Cobra orders them not to attack as they will just be throwing away their lives. The guards tell their king that they have sworn to protect him even to the death. Acknowledging their reputation, Crocodile offers to spare their lives if they leave and go home, to which they refuse. However, before they can attack, their bodies show signs changes and bruising. Chaka explains that to temporarily increase their power they must have drank hero water which grants incredible strength but kills the host and that they are good as dead. They proceed to attack Crocodile but he turns himself into sand and dodges their attack. Crocodile states that he won't bother to fight them since they're going to die anyway. Shortly thereafter, the two Majiri guards all collapse and die. Crocodile laughs at this which angers Chaka causing him to attack Crocodile. Chaka reveals his Inu Inu no no Mai model jackal devil fruit power. He is, however, unable to land a blow due to Crocodile's powers. Meanwhile, after his fight, Zoro collapses due to loss of blood. As he lies barely conscious he wonders how the others are doing and that they better not be dead. With this he thinks about Usopp. In another part of the city Sanji, along with Chopper and Usopp who are being carried by Matsuj, are running towards the palace. Usopp is in tears, remembering that Miss Merry Christmas told them that Luffy is dead. Chopper tearfully tells him that it might not be true while Sanji, with a smile on his face, asks them if they truly believed that. They answer that they believe Luffy is still alive. Cutting back to Zoro, he is now thinking about Nami and wondering if she managed to escape. Nami is then shown somewhere in Alibarna North Block, detangling her climb attack's final attack from Miss Doublefinger's body. She then proceeds to go to the palace. Zoro then wonders if Vivi is okay. Vivi is then shown calling out Chaka's name with Chaka lying down on the ground, bloodied. A figure then approaches Vivi and calls out her name. Scene cuts to the palace square, showing that there are 25 minutes left until the time of the explosion Crocodile has planned. The figure is revealed to be Koza, who is in disbelief on what he has seen before him. He sees the Timajiri guards dead on the ground, Chaka bloodied and lifeless, Cobra nailed to the palace walls, and that Crocodile, the supposed country's hero, is behind it all. Crocodile is amused at the turn of events where the country is in the midst of war and the leaders of both sides are not on the battlefield but are standing at his feet. Miss All Sunday ridicules Koza's confusion and offers to help him understand. She tells him to relax and open his mind and think of the worst possible scenario. Koza realizes that his father was right about Cobra and that he was wrong to doubt him. Koza demands to know who was responsible for the drought ravaging Arabasta, where Crocodile answers that for the past two years, every single malicious thing Koza attributed to Cobra was in fact perpetuated by him and his company, Baroque Works. 
Crocodile continues to taunt Koza, but Cobra calls his attention and demands that he listen. Cobra asks him to save as many citizens as he can. Chaka tells him about the bomb in the palace square and to hurry. Crocodile, seeing that Chaka is still alive, proceeds to strike him once more, seemingly killing him. Koza runs towards the palace square, but Vivi chases him and pulls him to the ground. She implores him to listen and think things through. She explains that if they tell everyone that the palace square will explode, everyone will panic which will add more chaos to the battle and that even if they stop the bomb, it doesn't really stop the fighting and people are still going to die. She tells him that they have to stop the rebellion instead and that he is the only one who can do it. Hearing their plans, Crocodile tries to stop them and attempts to strike Vivi, but is blocked by Chaka giving them time to get away. Vivi reaches the royal army and commands them to surrender immediately. Koza then comes out and tells the royal army that they no longer need to fight and that they just want to end the conflict. As the rebel army approaches the palace square, they see the royal army waving white flags of surrender. They also see their leader, Koza waving a white flag. He tells them to quiet their anger and lower their weapons. He announces that the battle is over. However, he is shot multiple times by what looks like a soldier of the royal army but is actually a Baroque Works agent who has infiltrated their ranks. Vivi screams in horror. Koza is shot by Baroque Works agents that have infiltrated the royal guards and as he collapses, he tries to tell the rebel army not to fight. The royal guards confront the solitaire that shot Koza, but as Koza once again tries to talk to the rebel army, a sandstorm blows through the palace obscuring the battlefield and allowing Baroque works agents that have infiltrated both sides to fire more shots towards the rebel army and royal guard, triggering a clash between them. Vivi and Koza try to stop the fighting, but their voices are drowned out by the fighting occurring in the palace square. In the palace, Chaka succumbs to his wounds and collapses and King Cobra tells Vivi to run away which she refuses, pointing out that Crocodile was the cause of the sandstorm and that she still wanted to stop the bomb that is set to explode in 15 minutes to at least save some of the fighters in the palace square. Crocodile then grabs Vivi by the neck, telling her she was too weak to have those zealous ideals and she reminds him that as the princess of the country, she will never yield to him or give up. Crocodile reminds Vivi that the rebel army reinforcements are still arriving and will walk into the range of the blast and then hangs her over the cliff by the neck as he lambastes her for her decision not to tell the soldiers about the bomb, pointing out that despite the panic, at least a few thousand would have survived. Crocodile notes that Vivi had been working as a spy in Baroque work for two years and then drops her off the cliff. In the distance, Luffy arrives flying on Pell to Crocodile's shock. They catch Vivi before she hits the ground, and she tells them about the bomb that is set to explode. At the palace square, Luffy and Vivi meet up with Chopper, Sanji and Usopp, as well as Zoro, who had been carrying Nami. Luffy apologizes for losing to Crocodile and promises not to lose again and tells them to take care of the other matters as he stretches up towards the palace to fight Crocodile. Crocodile attempts to dodge Luffy's hit, only to be punched in the face, making him bleed slightly. Before he could recover, Luffy attacks him again and Crocodile begins to realize that Luffy has uncovered his weakness. Luffy explains that he found his weakness after their first fight, when the water he got from Yuba spilled on Crocodile, preventing him from turning to sand. It with Crocodile lying on the ground, Luffy demands that he get up and fight. Crocodile laughs at this statement. Meanwhile, Vivi and the rest of the Straw Hats are in the palace square. Vivi explains that according to Crocodile, within 10 minutes, a huge cannon will be fired, and once the cannon is fired, no one within a 5km radius will survive, wiping out both the rebel and royal army forces. Zoro tells them that they need to find the cannon and stop the cannoneer from shooting. Before they can go ahead and look for the cannon, some Baroque works billions find Vivi and try to bring her to Crocodile for a promotion. Sanji and Zoro volunteer to stay behind to deal with the agents while the others go ahead and split up to look for the cannon. Crocodile is still laughing at Luffy's statement, telling him that it will not be so easy to defeat him, since he is one of the seven warlords of the sea. Luffy is unimpressed and says that if Crocodile is one of the seven warlords, then he is the eighth warlord. Cobra cannot believe what he is hearing and is impressed by Luffy's confidence. He asks who Luffy is, and Miss All Sunday tells him that he is the one responsible for bringing Vivi back to Arabasta. Even though Luffy has figured out how to land a punch on Crocodile, the warlord is still confident stating that even though Luffy can hit him, he can still absorb any fluid in Luffy's body. He proceeds to dehydrate Luffy's arm, which Luffy counters by drinking more water. The two continue their battle and Luffy reveals that he was planning to throw the barrel of water he was carrying to douse Crocodile in water. Crocodile predicts this move and counters it by conjuring a twister of sand, sending both Luffy and the barrel flying away. Luffy barely catches the barrel of water. Crocodile laughs at Luffy, telling him that this battle is no different from the first time they fought. Luffy proceeds to drink the whole barrel of water he was carrying and dubs himself as Water Luffy, showing a bloated stomach full of water, which shocks both Crocodile and Cobra and amuses Miss All Sunday. 
attacks Luffy, but Luffy squirts out water from his mouth and douses Crocodile with water, just as he planned, making the warlord susceptible to Luffy's physical attacks. Luffy uses his Gomu Gomu no Bazooka technique and hits Crocodile directly to his stomach, which sends him crashing. Crocodile is lying on the ground, not moving. Miss All Sunday removes the stakes impaling Cobra and demands that he show her the way to the pony glyph. Cobra asks what she wants with it, but she subdues him and reiterates her demand. Crocodile gets up and calls Miss All Sunday by her real name, Nico Robin, telling her that she should get going now to the pony glyphs. As Nico Robin and the king leave, Crocodile uses his ground seco technique which dehydrates all of their surroundings turning it to a desert wasteland. Luffy shoots water at Crocodile which he simply absorbs with his hand. He continues to suck the moisture out of ground, the effects of which are felt throughout the palace. With eight minutes left until the explosion, Vivi, Pell and the rest of the straw hat scramble to find the cannon. Meanwhile, Cobra asks if Nico Robin is truly Miss All Sunday's name. He remembers that the name was known throughout the world 20 years ago. On their way to the Poneglyphs, they encounter Tassidi and a bunch of marines. Tashiji refuses to let them pass, but Robin uses her abilities to incapacitate some of her men. Seeing the ability, a marine recognizes who she is and tells Tashigi that 20 years ago, when she was 8 years old, Robin earned a bounty of belly 79 million for sinking 6 marine ships, classifying her as a first degree risk. After the incident, she was said to have vanished and never heard from again. After hearing about her reputation, Tashigi commands her men to go to the palace square to stop the explosion, deeming it useless for so many men to fight against someone with her power. She stays behind, deciding to fight her, but Robin uses her ability against Tashigi and easily defeats her. In the palace, the entire lawn has turned to sand. Crocodile is able to sneak up on Luffy and grab him by the neck. Luffy spits water at Crocodile but misses and he proceeds to absorb all of the water in Luffy's body, dehydrating him. Luffy's signature straw hat is shown to be blown away by the wind. While still holding Luffy by the neck, Crocodile declares that Luffy has lost to him for the second time. Luffy's body water got dried out by Crocodile leaving Luffy close to death. However, the water he had shot out at Crocodile came falling and landed on him which brought him back to life. After Luffy recovered, he went searching for Crocodile. Nico Robin and King Cobra, on the way to the royal tomb, encountered the marines and were ordered to surrender however she overcame them easily. Sometime afterwards, Crocodile came by and laughed at them for being easily overcome. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Straw Hat crew, Vivi and Pell are still in search of the hidden cannon and time is counting down fast. Luffy, on the pursuit of Crocodile, came by Tashigi and requested which route Crocodile took. After some contemplation, she showed Luffy the way Crocodile went and scolded herself after he took off. Upon nearing the tomb, Luffy began to bleed and fell to the ground sleeping. Meanwhile, with the help of Cobra, Nico Robin found the Poneglyph and started reading it. Crocodile, at this point, had reached the location of the Poneglyph as well. The Straw Hats are still in search of the bomb. Upon encountering the Poneglyph, Nico Robin read and inquired from Cobra if there were any more Poneglyphs in the country and Cobra asked if she was disappointed by the one they found. Crocodile finds them and tells Nico Robin to read what is written on the Poneglyph. She began reading, however, she was simply reading the history of Arabasta to him. On hearing that, Crocodile got very upset and asked if the Poneglyph revealed the location of the ancient weapon Pluton. Nico Robin answered him saying nothing of the name Pluton is mentioned in this Poneglyph. Crocodile then told her that she has been useful for the four years they had been together operating Baroque works. However, she would have to die since she broke her promise of not giving him the location of Pluton after reading the Poneglyph. Nico Robin tried to kill him but failed. At that point, Cobra had initiated a timer that would destroy the underground tomb stating that both Crocodile and Nico Robin would die along with him because he would never let Crocodile have the country of sand. During the search of the bomb, Vivi ends up with a skinned knee when one of her platform sandal straps disintegrates from all the abusive running that has worn it apart. She got a revelation of the possible location of the bomb and had Usopp summon the remainder of the straw hats when they crossed the streets. Luffy is finally awake from his nap and went running searching for Crocodile. Crocodile informs Cobra that his plan to bury all three of them together is futile because he is able to turn the bedrock of the tomb to sand and make his escape. Vivi and Usopp are together and Vivi has an idea of where the cannon is hidden. Usopp had signaled the other member of the Straw Hat Pirates in the previous episode with one of his slingshot bombs. But billions from the Baroque works had found them instead. To distract them, Usopp uses a chalkboard and drags his nails down it to make a loud noise he grabs Vivi and runs away. Meanwhile, Luffy finds where Crocodile Nefertari Cobra and the critically injured Nico Robin is. Crocodile is upset that Luffy is still alive, no matter how many times he defeats Luffy. Cobra is baffled by who the strange boy is Luffy. Luffy demands that Crocodile give him back Vivi's country so Vivi can smile again. Luffy punches Crocodile twice and Crocodile is confused about how he is doing it without water. 
Luffy was using his blood to touch Crocodile, preventing Crocodile from using his powers from the Devil Fruit. Crocodile takes off a covering from his hook that reveals he has poison in it. Zoro runs to where the smoke bomb was shot by Usopp, but finds a group of marines who were with Tashigi. They berate him for having a poor sense of direction and then give him orders on where to go to find the center of the city of Alubarna. Vivi and Usopp are still running with Baroque works members chasing them. Tashiji and a few marine members attack the men chasing Vivi and Usopp. Nami and Tony Tony Chopper find Vivi and Usopp with two minutes left before the bomb kills the royal army and rebel army and everyone in the center of Alibarna. Pell is shot from the sky by a mysterious frog woman hidden in the clock tower who is later revealed to be working for Baroque Works. Luffy and Crocodile continue their fight and Luffy dodges Crocodile's attacks made by his hook. Cobra notices that Crocodile is struggling in the fight. Vivi is looking for Pell thinking he's their only hope to reach the cannon in time. Sanji and Zoro are in the clock tower. With 30 seconds left, the clock tower opens with Mr. Seven and Miss Father's Day inside laughing. Tashigi attacks the men from Baroque Works and tells the Marines they should not hesitate and they should immediately know who their enemy is. Seven and Miss Father's Day speak with joy about firing the bomb because that is their last mission from the boss and believe that they will get a promotion. Luffy continues to fight Crocodile, but the poison from Crocodile's hook has entered a wound on Luffy's shoulder, making his body numb. Crocodile tells Luffy that he should have forgotten about Vivi because he would have avoided such situations he has been in. Meanwhile, Nami came up with an idea to stop the bomb with the weapon Usopp created for her. The plan is aiding Vivi up the clock tower, starting by having her sitting on Chopper, who is standing on Usopp's shoulders. Nami then threw her climb attack between his legs using Cyclone Tempo, making him jump high enough for Chopper to jump towards Sanji, who kicks them towards Zoro. While midair and only seven seconds left, Mr. Seven and Miss Father's Day sees them coming, and shoots at them, but only hits Zoro, who managed to push Chopper and Vivi out of the way and high enough for Chopper to throw Vivi towards the clock tower. With five seconds left, Vivi is able to cut the fuse that will activate the bomb. Meanwhile, Crocodile laughs at how pathetic Luffy looks with the poison running through his body. Crocodile tells Nefertari Cobra that he was well prepared for this big event, and the time bomb would do plenty of damage from where it is placed, and it would only delay the bomb for a couple of seconds or so. Vivi finds out that the cannon is also a time bomb and cries with frustration because she sees that Crocodile is mocking at her. He had told her before that she will not succeed in saving her beloved country, no matter what she does. Pell shows up and while Vivi is trying to tell him about the time bomb, he speaks of how the clock tower brings back so many memories from Vivi's childhood. In Pell's flashback, he tells Vivi that he is a guard that is there to protect his country. He takes the time bomb and flies up towards the sky. As he is flying away, in the background, his voice is heard and he says, I am Erebasta's guardian deity, the Falcon, and I am sworn to destroy the enemies of the royal family. When the sentence is finished, the time bomb blows up. Vivi is distraught after Pell's sacrifice. Even though he got the bomb away, the shock wave still knocks people down and damages buildings. None of the straw hats on the surface can believe it, either. Even worse, the residents of Alibarna just get up and start killing each other again. Tashigi is held back by marines on the scene from interfering. Having lost all hope, Vivi just starts repeatedly screaming, Please stop fighting from the bell tower. Only the straw hats can hear her. Nami sensing Vivi's pain and frustration tells the others to go stop the civil war at all costs. Under Alibarna, the tomb is crumbling. King Cobra and Miss All Sunday are both out, as well as apparently Luffy. Crocodile revels in what seems to be his ultimate victory. However, Luffy gets up, much to Crocodile's shock. Cobra comes to as well as Luffy declares he cannot be beaten. Crocodile tries to get him with his hook again, but Luffy kicks it away so hard the hook breaks off. Luffy starts beating on Crocodile and is making headway, throwing him through the ruins. Crocodile has no idea why the scorpion venom is not working on Luffy. He deploys a knife from the stub of his hook, but when he lunges at Luffy, he gets kicked up into the ruins' rafters. Tired of these games, he uses Sable's Posado to blow away more ruins. Luffy inflates his body, then twists and blows, rifling up toward Crocodile. Luffy begins Gomu Gomu No Storm, using his Gatling attack while rocketing toward his enemy. Crocodile counters with Desert La Spada, forming a giant set of claw blades, but they are neutralized by Luffy's blood-soaked fists. Crocodile gets pummeled against the ceiling of the ruins. To Cobra's shock, Crocodile is eventually driven through several feet of bedrock and hundreds of feet into the air above Ali Barna. The Straw Hats and Vivi see Crocodile's unconscious body tumble through the air, and Vivi recalls reading about the worsening situation in Arabasta during their journey. Although the Straw Hats rejoice in Luffy's victory initially, the civil war continues to rage around them. As Vivi continues to beg them to stop, rain suddenly begins to fall. As they feel Alibarna's first rainfall in three years, the people finally stop fighting. 
Eventually, the dust clears, and the people finally hear Vivi's pleas to stop fighting. The people drop their partisans when they realize their princess is alive and well. As Crocodile collides with the street, Luffy hits the bottom of the tomb next to King Cobra. Vivi tells her people the nightmare is finally over and Cobra thanks Luffy. Although the people's anger is quelled, they don't initially believe Vivi's claim that the nightmare is over. The people are still angry that King Cobra apparently attacked Nanohana. At this point, Shaka orders the royal army of Arabasta to stand down. Also, Igaram appears, to Vivi's relief as she descends the clock tower. He presents Kappa, the kid who was allegedly hurt by the royal army in Nanohana. Kappa testifies to the treachery of Crocodile and Baroque works, and how Mr. Ubon Kure impersonated King Cobra. The people finally agree to throw their weapons down for good. In the streets, the Straw Hat pirates are met by King Cobra, who is carrying Luffy, weak but alive. Sanji doesn't know who Cobra is at first, until Vivi runs to him and hugs him. Cobra said Luffy somehow found the strength to carry both of them up to the surface. He also says Luffy got an antidote for Crocodile's poison, though he'll still need to be treated for his injuries. The Straw Hats say they'll make their way to the palace incognito when they're ready, since they're wanted. The people gather around the disgraced Crocodile as the Marines arrive with Tashigi. Tashigi reveals that her men had confiscated Baroque work ships with dance powder, a powder that can induce rain, and linked them to Crocodile. She strips him of his title as Warlord of the Sea and places him under arrest, though he's still unconscious and can't resist anyway. The rest of Baroque works is out of commission except for Mr. Two, who sneaks through Ali Barna to get away. Koza tries to reconcile the actions of the rebellion as he digests Crocodile's treachery, but King Cobra tells his people they can get past this ugly moment in their history, and Arabasta can continue to move forward. On the coastline, Hina accuses Smoker of using the dance powder. Smoker says he knows King Cobra was trying to protect his kingdom without using it and didn't want to ruin that. He asks Hina to take the ship they are aboard, the Baroque Works Rainmaker ship, and Crocodile to headquarters. Tashiji also orders the Marines in her unit to turn a blind eye to the Straw Hats. The wounded are cleared from Alibarna Square, and Koza assures Vivi that he'll be fine. The people of Arabasta rejoice at the return of the rain. That evening, back at the palace, the Straw Hats finally made it back and are now recuperating from their injuries. Vivi is watching the rain in their room when Egaram came in. He eulogizes Pell and honors his bravery in protecting the kingdom. The next day, at the port where the marines are moored, Tashigi arrives with Crocodile. She reports to Smoker and apologizes for letting Luffy go. Smoker ignores it. Tashigi feels as if she could not figure out what true justice was in the situation and was ashamed that she assisted the Straw Hats in defeating Crocodile. Smoker starts talking about ambition and how some he knows are making names for themselves. Smoker provides no comfort to the conflicted Tashidi, only telling her to get stronger if she is feels she is not up to the task. She declares she will, and he tells the other soldiers they can only wish for guts like hers. Marine headquarters places a Den Den Mushi call in to Smoker, requesting he and Tashigi report in. They have ignored his report, and are crediting him and Tashigi with the apprehension of Crocodile, with promotions and rank to match. Hina says the world government wants to cover up the Straw Hat's involvement. Unwilling to accept that, Smoker angrily tells the world government what they can do with their promotion. Doctor. Ho wonders over Chopper's skill at mixing medicine. As she passes by, Vivi notes that he was trained as a doctor on Drum Island. Doctor. Ho notes he did not know about Chopper's techniques despite 40 years of training himself. Chopper goes into his usual routine of responding to praise with insults. But Doctor. Ho translates them as appreciation. Vivi cares for Luffy at a nearby bed, with Keru laying at the next bed over. Sanji and Usopp walk through the capital city as it rebuilds, remarking at the people's resilience as they rebuild. Sanji quickly walks away from one area when he recalls that a particular set of holes through a series of buildings was caused by him. Zoro is elsewhere, working on his concentration by balancing boulders on his fists, seeking to be able to call upon his utmost skills at the shortest notice. In the palace library, King Cobra encourages Nami to take as many books as she likes back with her when the Straw Hats depart. Chaka and his guards hold off marines who are looking for Luffy and Zoro while Sanji and Usopp, who are not yet wanted, walk by unnoticed. Luffy soon wakes up and is feeling much better. He looks for his hat, then quickly feels hungry, and is conflicted between looking for his hat and finding food. Usopp points out Luffy's straw hat on the next bed over it was found at the ruins by a soldier. Luffy had no idea that he was in bad shape when he was brought to the palace infirmary, and thanks Chopper and Vivi for nursing him back to health. A figure comes in, sensing Luffy's awakening. At first, Zoro thinks it's Igaram cross-dressing, but it's actually his wife, Terracotta, the royal chef. Zoro notes how disturbingly similar she looks to Igaram. She is personally overseeing the banquet to thank Luffy for rescuing Vivi and her husband. 
Having heard of Luffy's legendary appetite, she has brought a large tray of fruit for Luffy to tide him over before dinner. He scarfs the entire tray up in a split second. Terracotta looks forward to the challenge of feeding Luffy. At the banquet that follows, the palace guards stand in disbelief as the straw hats gorge themselves, especially Luffy, who has a bad habit of eating food off other people's plates. Sanji is concerned over how fast Chopper is sucking down pasta. Asop puts the contents of one of his Tabasco no boshi on a rice ball as a trick Luffy eats it, of course, and spits fire. Vivi just laughs at the spectacle, and soon even the guards can't help but laugh as the banquet gets even more raucous. It eventually involves the nose chopsticks. All the while, Terracotta cooks happily, embracing the challenge. Later on, Cobra invites the straw hats to the baths. Eventually, Sanji asks Igaram to show him toward the lady's side of the bath so he can do some peeping. He gets offended, but Cobra himself points at a wall they can look over, even though his daughter is in there. Nami and Vivi have that side of the bath to themselves, even though it is as spacious and lavish as the men's side. Nami wonders if a ship could carry such a bath. Vivi notes of all the wonderful things they have seen on their voyage together. As they get ready to switch so Nami can wash Vivi, they notice all the men looking over the wall Luffy, Sanji, Usopp, Chopper, even Cobra and Igaram, only Zoro absent. Nami has a simple solution. She stands, pulling her towel around her, and tells the men they will owe her belly 100,000 each for this. She then unleashes her most diabolical move happiness punch. She opens her towel, bearing her entire body to the guys. They are all stunned, getting massive nosebleeds and falling back to their side, Sanji mumbling. With their bath back to themselves, Nami notes the Straw Hats might leave Arabasta that evening. There's no reason for them to stay, and the Marines are probably looking for them by now. This news startles Vivi. On the men's side, Cobra does something unexpected by bowing to the Straw Hats. Igaram is alarmed by his UN kingly display of bowing to another man, but Cobra notes there's no such thing as a naked king. He is thanking them as a resident of Arabasta for saving his kingdom, and as a father for saving his daughter. Nami and Vivi overhear Cobra's gesture. As night falls over the palace, Nami officially suggests to the others that they leave tonight. Zoro and Sanji agree with her reasoning. Luffy wants some more food, but Zoro says they have to leave immediately. Elsewhere in the palace, Shaka and Igaram have received a new bounty poster for Luffy, and one for Zoro as well. Luffy's bounty has been raised to Billy 100 million, and Zoro now has a bounty of Billy 60 million. Igaram remarks that Luffy cannot turn back now that he's defeated one of the seven warlords of the sea. Later that night, Igaram runs to warn the Straw Hats, but they are already gone, only Vivi left in their room. Vivi tells him they've already left. Elsewhere in Arabasta, two marine sergeants appear on a ship. One of them is Django, who has turned traitor on the pirate movement. The other is Full Body, who has apparently gotten new cloud among the marines. They have taken down a pirate ship and are dancing in victory. On the nearby dock, Hina is disappointed that their operation took so long. Another marine notes that all harbors are blockaded, but the going Mary has gone missing from Iramalu. She orders the marines to search all over for their ship. Django and Fullbody return to Hina. She orders them to begin patrol for the Straw Hat Pirates, to their excitement. The Straw Hats are running across the desert on a group of riding ducks. Luffy is still eating Sanji shares that he got some recipes and spices from terracotta so he can make some native dishes in the future. Chopper looks at Nami, who is feeling down right now. Sanji suspects she's thinking about Vivi. Nami says she's down because she's giving up the Bailey 1 billion ransom she originally extorted from Igaram. Everyone is shocked that she's feeling down about giving up the money, as opposed to leaving Vivi behind. Usopp ends up falling off his duck. Igaram wants Vivi to ride to the Straw Hats and warn them about their increased bounties, but Vivi knows Karu will never be able to catch them by now. Vivi insists they'll be alright, and pushes Igaram out of the room so she can sleep. She is due to address the people of Arabasta the next day. Igaram is concerned that she is too calm about it. Before she goes to bed, Vivi notes how quiet it is now that she's away from the Straw Hats. Earlier in the day, the Straw Hats got a call over Den Den Mushi from somebody named Bon Chan. They recognize it as Bon Kari. Luffy wonders what he wants. He claims that he's taken their ship to the Upper Sandora River, and that they are now friends. Zoro says they have no choice but to go where he took their ship, and keep a watchful eye on if he has any tricks for them. Vivi gets their attention and asks what she should do. She is still uncertain whether to stay or go. Nami says they will get their ship and sail to the Eastern Harbor. If Vivi is not there by noon, they will consider her to be staying and leave without her. It is at that point that the Straw Hats take their leave. Vivi notes she can leave for the Eastern Harbor at 8 a.m. and make it on time if she chooses the question is, whether to be a pirate or a princess? She asks Karu what he would like to do. Bon Kure greets the Straw Hats as they arrive at the Going Merry. Luffy is leery of Bon's help, since he lied earlier about helping them. But there's no longer a point to Bon for them to be enemies since Baroque works is history. 
He says he took the Going Mary to keep it from being captured by the Marines and alerts them that they have blocked all the ports. Luffy accepts him as a friend, but Zoro thinks Bond's just doing it because he's just as trapped by the Marines as they are. He admits that this is the case, and Bon Kure's ship appears shortly thereafter to assist. The Marines and the Straw Hats have begun battle and the Marines are attempting to sink the Going Merry, leaving the crew in a pinch. Luffy recognized Django and questioned why he was a Marine with Django answering that he has his own reasons. Sanji, on the other hand, commented that the man next to Django appeared familiar. Full Buddy commented that Sanji and his crew will meet their doom on that day since he's powered up. Asop went to the cannon launcher and launched a cannon at Django which destroyed the ship he was on as well as the ship Full Buddy was on. Luffy then praised Usopp's marksmanship saying it was awesome. Bon Kure told them to escape after those two ships were destroyed and received word that Hina the Black Cage had arrived. He explained that Black Cage Hina is the marine headquarters captain that patrolled that area. Bon Kure questioned why the Straw Hats would not escape and Nami told him about the promise they made with Luffy adding that it was so they could meet a friend. Cobra and Igaram visit Vivi and she announced she would like to tell them something very important. With his disguise ability, Bon Kure fooled the marines into pursuing him, allowing the Straw Hats to escape. Bon Kure recited his Okamawe poem and prepared to engage the marines in battle. Upon witnessing what was unfolding between Bon Kure's crew and the marines, the Straw Hats cried and swore never to forget them. Another crew of marine ships attacked the Straw Hats again but were overwhelmed. Vivi began her speech which was secretly about her travel with the Straw Hats. On hearing the speech, Zoro and Sanji told Luffy that they had to leave since it appeared Vivi was not coming. Moreover, they were under attack again by another crew of marine ships. The country's people who came to watch Vivi give her speech realized Igaram's attempt to disguise as Vivi and yelled for him to step down. Vivi made it to the harbor and found the Straw Hat crew waiting as promised. Vivi told them she came to say goodbye and she would be staying behind. She however asked, if they ever meet again, would they consider her as part of their family? Luffy was about to give her a verbal answer when Nami shut him up. She told him the marines have seen Vivi and responding verbally would make them consider her as part of them thus making her into a criminal. So, to give a silent answer and goodbye, the Straw Hats rose their left arm with the cross mark on it as proof that they consider her one of them. Vivi and Karu also rose their left arm at the shore, indicating their friendship. Hina explains to Smoker that they sunk Bon Kuri's ship and captured his crew, but the Straw Hats managed to run away. Although, Hina observes that Smoker seems pleased that they managed to escape. King Cobra continues the speech given to the kingdom started by Vivi. Chaka mourns Pell's death at his grave, though he admits that he cannot accept Pell is really gone. Back at Yuba, Toto continues to laugh since hearing the kingdom-wide speech, as he is one of the few people who know the true extent of the Straw Hat's involvement in saving Arabasta. It then cuts to various people and animals who interacted with the Straw Hats through their journey in the desert. Among them are citizens' reactions and plans for the future. Crocodile's Casino will probably be shut down as people do not have time to take care of it, neither would they want to. It is then revealed that Pell survived the blast. The marines continue to attack the Going Merry and it seems to be sinking. Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji decide they've got to fight them when they trip over large metal pipes Usopp kept which they then decide to throw out. Luffy throws them all off the ship and they end up striking the marine ships, disabling them. Using this to their advantage they make a quick escape. After hearing of the escape, Smoker informs Tashigi of the bounties on Luffy and Zoro, informing her of the latter's exploits at Whiskey Peak and his victory over Daz Bonaz in Arabasta. He assures her they will get their rematch another time as Tashigi vows to defeat Zoro. Meanwhile, the Straw Hats bemoan the loss of Vivi except Zoro who says if they miss her so much they may as well have forced her to come along. The others insult him except Luffy who does not know how to make up a proper insult. Suddenly the door to the captain's cabin opens revealing Nico Robin. Everyone who knows who she is panics. Robin says Luffy did something to her and Sanji immediately gets angry at him. Luffy has no idea what she's talking about, but Robin insists that he put her through excruciating treatment and that he needs to take responsibility by allowing her to become part of their crew. Flashback to the temple collapse as Luffy lay unconscious. Robin gives King Cobra the antidote to Crocodile's poison, telling him Luffy could survive the collapse due to his rubber body. She admits that she did lie to Crocodile about the Poneglyph and never had any intention of handing over a weapon to him the Poneglyph's inscriptions actually are about Pluton, but she told Crocodile that they only list the monarchs of Alabasta. As Cobra administers the medicine, she tells him the truth all she wants to know is the true history through the Rio Poneglyph. Now she's given up. She spent 20 years looking for it, and Arabasta was her last good lead. At that point, she believed there were simply too many enemies in the path to achieving her dream. Luffy then wakes and saves Cobra and Robin, even though she tells him to just leave her to die, but he ignores her resolutely, why do I have to listen to you? Back in the present, Robin says that she now has nowhere else to go and that Luffy's crime was forcing her to live when she wished to die. 
Luffy allows her on the crew without another word, shocking the others. He says she is no longer a threat to them. As she allows Luffy and Chopper to play with her powers, Usopp attempts to interrogate her, but fails rather miserably and ends up terrified of her. However, Nico Robin reveals something about her past. She is an archaeologist since the age of eight, but she also did a lot of other jobs, including killing. Nami is bribed by jewels and gems into accepting her and Sanji was gone from the word go since she's a woman. Meanwhile, Usopp, Luffy, and Chopper are having too much fun playing games with her. The only one who stays suspicious is Zoro, but even he is briefly disarmed by her cheerfulness. As things on the going merry get back to as close to normal as they ever are. Cut back to Erebasta one last time, Pell drops his crutch as he finds himself standing at his own grave. 